Now let's go to William James, latter part of the 19th century, died in 1910. He was brilliant. I think he was to psychology what Einstein was to physics. But Einstein's revolu a re a revolution, because that was the second revolution with quantum mechanics, that one actually took off. The revolution that William James was proposing was aborted. William James, like Galileo and Darwin, proposed that the phenomena that were of interest, and for William James, nothing more of greater interest, I think, than the nature of mental phenomena. He defined psychology as a study of the very stuff that we experience subjectively, thoughts and images, memories, emotions, desires, fantasies, dreams, the whole range of subjectively experienced mental phenomena. He said, that's what psychology is about. That's what we should study. And therefore, since that's what we're trying to understand, just as Galileo, first, foremost, and all, all, and all was primarily relied upon the observation of celestial phenomena, Darwin, first, for, foremost, and always relying upon the, the observation of biological phenomena, James said, do the same thing for the mind. First, foremost, and always, he said, let the primary thrust of your inquiry into the nature of the natural phenomena of the mind be that of introspection. Which means observe them. And it would be nice if we could just observe everybody else's thoughts, although I'm not quite sure how nice that would be. But it certainly would give us a lot more data. Right? But we're basically stuck with kind of flaky inferences. Sometimes robust, uh, sometimes just completely off the wall when we're trying to surmise, to figure out, to draw inferences about other people's mental states, their desires, their emotions, and so forth and so on. Anybody who's been married knows how difficult it is, even with a person you've lived with for years, to keep on you know, getting, a, getting a bullseye every time you draw an inference. What was she thinking? What was he hoping? What was he, what was he responding to? What was his emotion then? What was... What's going on? And it's hit and miss. So given the fact that, at least for most of us, we have no direct access, no observational ability to directly measure, observe other people's... Then we're just stuck with N equals one. One subject, and say, well, at least I can observe somebody's mental phenomena. Mine. And maybe I'm not a species unto myself, Maybe what I observe in my mind is going to be comparable to, in some respects, what you observe in your mind, and then we can get together and cross-reference. So he proposed this rigorous observation of mental phenomena, but this proposal was thwarted, I would say, ideologically, by the hierarchy of scientism. And no sooner was he in the grave than John Watson got out and said, forget William James. Psychology will be the study of behavior, because that's what we're good at. We're good at studying objective, physical, quantifiable stuff. Behavior is. Thoughts, emotions, desires, mental images aren't. So let's continue doing what we're good at and not even talk about the mind. Let's just talk about what we can talk about objectively and start at a role of 50, 50 years of behaviorism. Some of the more radical behaviors saying mental phenomena don't even exist. Consciousness is a name for something that doesn't exist at all. In other words, they went completely bonkers. They got over it. I mean, I think we're pretty much through that time now. Uh, but the fragrance, I'm going to use a nice term, the fragrance of that lingers into the present day. But what I would say, this is my opinion, that had we been able to develop William James's idea, which he did not bring to completion, he just gave us some really good guidelines, but if we had followed through that through, it might have occurred that we developed a true revolution in the mind sciences. I would say over the last 130 years, we have not. I would say there's been no revolution in the mind sciences. There have been many excellent insights, enormous amount of knowledge, a lot of it of great value in the psychoanalytic tradition, in psychophysics, cognitive psychology, social behaviorism, a lot was learned. Affective psychology, personality psychology, developmental psychology, I'm not at all dismissing these. I think they've all had great successes and there's been a good, de good deal of consensus among them. But a revolution? Who? Freud? I don't think so. Who? Who brought about a revolution? If we look at the assumptions that were underlying the, the birth of psychology in the 1860s and then developing more steam in the 1870s with Wilhelm Wundt in Leipzig and William James at Harvard, the basic assumptions are pretty much the assumptions that are widespread now. Where was a massive assumption that's been completely overthrown? 
that we can say we can no longer look at the mind in the same way ever again. A lot of people reject Freud out of hand. Brilliant, a lot of insights, a lot of illusions of knowledge as well. So it was the revolution that didn't happen. The revolution that got thwarted by the internal inadequacies and problems, unresolved problems in the so-called introspectionist movement. It was definitely fraught with problems. William James did not have a recipe for solving all the problems, the challenges of introspection. But then they just threw out the baby with the bathwater. And they turned the study of the, of, of the study of the mind to an objective science. We'll study the mind, we'll study yours. We'll study your mind by way of studying your behavior, your speech, that is your reports of your experience, and we'll, now we'll spend lots and lots of money studying your mind by way of your brain. And if we want to just take a shortcut, we'll just say your mind is the brain, and that makes things a lot simpler. One more illusion of knowledge. I said I'd talk about bringing together Buddhism and, and physics. Buddhism and physics. I think some of the most adventuresome and bold theorists in this whole issue of the role, the nature of consciousness in the larger framework, not just the brain, but consciousness in our universe at large, some of the boldest thinkers in the reading that I've done are not to be found in the mind sciences. They tend to be a pretty conservative lot, and their physics tends to be 19th century physics, the good old days when physics meant chunky stuff floating around in absolute space-time. The good old days. When, pe- when the physicists rode to their labs in horses and buggies. But a lot has happened since then, and the, the life sciences and the mind sciences, frankly, I think have not really kept up much. They're just assuming that 20th century physics is irrelevant, and therefore they don't need to study it. One more illusion of knowledge. But Andrei Lint is one of our leading physicists, a Russian, but who's, who's been teaching now for years at Stanford, brilliant theoretician, working on, the, uh, on cosmology, the, flas- the inflationary mo- model of the, of the following the Big Bang and so forth, Absolutely brilliant. And he is adventuresome. He's not providing answers here. He's providing provocative questions. One provocative question is worth a ton of mind-numbing data. I think these are cool questions. And illuminating, casting a bright light on illusions of knowledge, which all of us are prone to. Theologians, scientists, philosophers, me, Buddhists, and so forth. Here, a standard assumption is that consciousness... Just like space-time before the invention of general relativity plays a secondary subservient role, being just a function of matter, that is consciousness just being a function of the matter inside our heads, and a tool for the description of the truly existing material world, that is, it's with consciousness that we can then describe what's going on really out there. But let us remember that our knowledge of the world begins not with matter but with perception. Matter, like the category of the physical, is a human construct. It wasn't a given to us at some point that nature got really generous and said, you want a definition? Here's a keeper. Never happened. We keep on defining and redefining and redefining, and the same as for the physical, the same goes for matter. Matter is a construct that we sift out of, we derive from our perceptions, our measurements, our visual observations, and so forth. What is primary is our perception. What is derivative is our understanding of and our way of conceiving and measuring matter. It suddenly turns the tables. Rather than simply assuming that matter is absolutely primary and all mental phenomena are derivative or even epiphenomenal, he's saying, let's get real. What we know more than we know, what we know with greatest certainty are the immediate contents of our experience, our perceptions. Is it possible, here's his juicy question, is it possible that consciousness, like space-time, has its own intrinsic degrees of freedom and that neglecting these will lead to a description of the universe that is fundamentally incomplete? What if our perceptions are as real, or maybe in a certain sense even more real, than material objects? In other words, space-time since general relativity, space-time there is a full-fledged equal partner with mass energy. Right? It was assumed prior to rel- relativity theory that there was an asymmetry between mass energy on the one hand and space-time on the other. That is, you could have a region of space, it's inert. It just sits there. And then a body of matter comes in and it fills it and it, it changes that space because it got a bunch of chunky stuff in it. But the space wouldn't do anything. The space just kind of sits there and fill me. 
you know. It just sits there. So the causal interaction there was one way. Matter influences space. Space, I mean, space, what, what space influence? It's just nothing, right? Until relativity theory. Until we find, aha, there's another take on gravity. It's not some invisible field emanating out from the sun, but in fact the very space in which the sun and the earth are embedded gets warped by the mass of the sun, and it's because space itself is curved that the earth is going in a straight line in curved space. Or photons from a distant star. It was 1917, I think. Um, Eddington, Sir Arthur Eddington, I believe his name was, got the first empirical evidence that Einstein's general theory of relativity really had some oomph behind it. That is, he saw that there was evidence, clear empirical evidence, that photons bent. When they, they bent, when they came near, when they were passing from behind a, a planet, I think it was Mercury, if I remember correctly, that when they pass near it or pass near the sun, they actually bend. The, the, the straight line of the photon bends, but photons don't go in curves, they go in straight lines. Therefore, if they're going in straight lines, it must be space that curves. In other words, space influences matter as matter influences space. There's a symmetry. They impact each other. Which would imply then, if we extrapolate from that, it's not only the brain, this material stuff inside the skull, that influences, generates mental phenomena, states of consciousness. But states of consciousness impact, influence the brain. And not only the brain, but remember the levitating hand. And then all the other things. You want to see something else levitate? It's pretty, pretty cool. Watch that. Watch the... What? what? No strings, you know? Mind over matter all over again. You know, so empire state buildings and all these constructs, that all the ways we've impacted the world, to a large extent, it's mind doing that. It's mind behind it. So he's asking here, might it be the case that in our natural world, space-time is fundamental, mass energy is fundamental, consciousness, might it be equally fundamental? not derivative, not a side product, not an epiphenomenon or an emergent property of some configuration of matter, might consciousness just be as, as primary as anything else? It's a good question. Can we possibly tackle it? Well, I want to now go, now we're starting to move towards Buddhism. Not quite there, we'll get there very quickly. And that is natural sciences. The natural sciences progress when they are driven by the engine of empiricism and not inhibited by the brick wall of dogmatism and illusions of knowledge. Astronomy progresses by making more and more careful, probing, sophisticated, penetrating observations. It's breathtaking. This is one of my favorite, favorite instances with a big analogy that I'm going to get to very shortly. But I thought this was so cool when I read about it. I still think it's very cool. The Hubble telescope, I think it was some hundreds of millions of dollars. It was not cheap but I'm quite happy they have it up there. A few years back, 2003 to 4, they did something called the Hubble Ultra Deep Field Probe. They found a region of space one-tenth of the diameter of the full moon, so a tiny, tiny little sliver, a tiny, tiny section of the night sky that was very dark, exceptionally dark. It was so dark they thought, boy, it looks like there's nothing there at all, or maybe just a few stars, maybe, maybe a galaxy. But it was like one of those dark areas of space, kind of like boring area. Little tiny, see that little smidgen? That's a boring area. Said, so let's, let's direct our Hubble telescope for a million seconds on the dark area and see what we see. Because you have no idea what you see, right? Maybe you'll see Bugs Bunny. Not likely, but you know, see what you see. And so the, it rotated, as I recall, 400 times around the Earth, and then in a whole series of exposures totaling one million seconds, they did an ongoing time-lapse photography, in a manner, in a manner of speaking, of this tiny, tiny region of space that was so dark to take a very close look at it. And as I recall, there were so few, so few, to- so few photons coming from the distant reaches of that area of dark space. It was something like one a second. Can you imagine the lucky photon? Well, and once a second, go... It's kind of slow photon because they mostly went elsewhere. There weren't so many that traveled from 10 billion light years away and had just the right trajectory to go into the Hubble telescope. Hole in one. Gives me the creeps. 
they found in that dark space about 10,000 galaxies. A galaxy has anywhere from 100 billion to a trillion stars. That was the dark region. And they got it not by taking a snapshot or even by using a terrestrial-based telescope and doing you know, five hours, a million seconds with the best telescope we have there with no atmospheric aberrations or distortion, 10,000 galaxies. And they, as what they were able to do with this is look into embryonic states of galaxies in their early formation only as early as 700 million years after the Big Bang. Bearing in mind, we're now about 13.7 billion years. They saw galaxies in the formation, weird-shaped galaxies. Galaxies just coming into childhood, into adolescence, into adulthood. They're looking, literally, they're looking back in time. The further, I mean, this is just straight astronomy, nothing special. Well, it's so totally cool, but it's become something of a commonplace. The further you are able to look away, the further you're in space, the further back in time you're looking. So if you're observing a galaxy in formation that is 13 billion year, light years away, you're looking at something that was, what, 700 million, taking place 700 million years after the Big Bang, very, very early in the formation of the universe. You're getting a history lesson. Right. So astonishing. And the whole night sky contains 12.7 million times the area as in that little tiny spot that they looked in, in this ultra-deep field. It's just, I think, a magnificent instance of the power of meticulous, sustained, careful observation. Who would have thought 10,000 galaxies? And by the way, the overall number that of, in the known universe, as I recall, 50 to 100 billion galaxies. You could gaze at the night sky with the naked eye for as long as you like, and you're going to get about 3,000 stars or at least 3,000 little pinpricks of light. They might be stars, planets, they might be even a galaxy. About 3,000 little, little pinholes, 